is confidential information. They can't reveal confidential information to you. The buyer did not like that result. The buyer went to the appellate court. The appellate court said, we disagree with the trial court. The appellate court in a published opinion said, no, no, no. We acknowledge that this information, how much the seller owes to their lender, might in fact be confidential information. But we're saying, listing agent, you have an obligation of honesty, good faith, and fair dealing towards the buyer. And that obligation trumps your duty of confidentiality and your duty of loyalty to the seller. And so you have an obligation to reveal confidential, this confidential information to the buyer. So I presume that the pre prelim was not provided in Vietnamese to the buyer. Uh, <laughs> so, so was the prelim provided to the buyer? Well, that's not part of the facts of the case. I don't know what was provided to the buyer. But let me tell you something that the court said. The court actually did address the issue of prelim. And the court said, well, when do you get a prelim? You get it after you are already in contract. The court said, that's too late. The disclosure needs to be made before you enter into the contract. Okay. Now, when we look at this case, and we asked, uh, broker's lawyer, well, are you appealing this? Are you going to try to go to the Supreme Court? They said no. They said, we think we're going to be successful in this case anyway. Because the buyer was suing, how's the buyer going to get damages? They didn't pay for the property, so they weren't hurt. They didn't overpay for the property because they didn't get the property. The buyer said, well, I sold my home. And the broker's attorney is saying, you know what, you should be glad. <laughs> you sold your home and property value has been going down, 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 down. Look how much more you can get for your money now. What are you complaining about? Okay, so the broker's attorney said, we're not pursuing this case anymore. But they said, you know, Sierra, we think you should do something about this case. We're like, what can we do? Well, there actually is something we could do. And it's something that we actually did. We wrote a letter to the California Supreme Court saying, depublish this case, take it off the books. Pretend it does not even exist. Like I said, when I look at this case, I'm not really that concerned about it. You know, if they had used the short sale information, or the short sale listing at that time, if they'd used the short sale addendum, it wouldn't even be an issue. So why would we write this letter to the court? Well, we wrote this letter to the court not so much for this particular set of facts, but the court has now put into play the appellate court, which means its decision is binding on all courts throughout the state of California. The appellate court has put into play this issue. Disclosures have to be made before a contract is entered into. Is that when most of your sellers make their disclosures? Don't they usually fill out a transfer disclosure statement and give it to the buyer after <coughs> the contract is entered into? So we said, well, we don't like that. I mean, okay, maybe we can understand it in this context, but it's so easy to take that concept and apply it everywhere else. So like, we don't like this concept floating around in the law. And we also don't like the concept that a listing broker has an obligation to disclose confidential information to a buyer. Like, maybe we can understand it in the context of a short sale, but if you look at the language used by the court in this opinion, it could apply anywhere else. Like, so where are we gonna draw the line? Then what's the difference between your fiduciary duty to a seller and your duty of honesty, good faith, and fair dealing to the buyer. It seems like there's no difference at all. Matter of fact, it seems like the interest of the buyer outweighs the interest to your own fiduciary. So it's a real long shot to try to get a case depublished, de but we wrote a letter, it was sent to the court last week, 
and we'll probably find out in the next um, 14 years. 14 years. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll actually know within the next 60 days if the court decides to depublish it or just leave the case alone. Well, in the meantime, do we have to disclose to everybody the lender? The in the meantime, I think if you're taking a short sale listing, I mean, our advice is still use the listing addendum, short sale information advisory, use the short sale addendum, which is at time of contract informing the buyer that you need short sale lender's approval. So our advice is use our forms and you'll be okay. okay? Now what happens if the seller says, in today's world, don't tell anybody? Okay. Well, <coughs> even before this case, I'd say, I'd be a little worried about that sell. I'd be a little worried about that listing. Now, with this case, I'd be really worried about taking that listing. Okay. <coughs> and indeed, even in this opinion, the court used some language that said, if a seller tells you not to disclose, that they're $400,000 short on the sale, then you are taking that listing at your own peril. And I think that's the advice we have. You're taking your chances if you do that. Okay, quick question, I'm gonna go on. Next Was it step. proven that the listing agent knew? Was it proven that the listing agent knew? This case did not go to trial. This case was decided on something called demur, which means the listing agent said, I just have no legal obligation. This <coughs> trial court, you should just dismiss this case outright. So when the appellate court made this decision that said, yes, there is a duty, now it's gonna go back to trial, and that's why the listing broker's attorney is so confident that they're gonna win, that the buyer's not gonna be able to prove any damages. It did not go to trial. There was no factual proof on any issue as of the time you of this case. Went on, do you think that they would say that you would have to know, or they would assume that you knew, or does it really matter? If it went on, does it matter if you actually knew? Okay. Does it matter if you actually knew? The issue is, what did you know? We had a whole issue like that something in the 80s too, right? What did you know and when did you know it? Right? So that ultimately may be an issue. Okay, for this case it didn't matter because in this case what the buyer said in their lawsuit, the buyer said the listing broker did know. So as long as the buyer made that allegation, just procedurally that was assumed to be true. Now I have to tell you, factually from what the listing broker's attorney tells me, the listing broker did know. Okay, so that's not gonna help them <laughs> in this case. All right, case number two. Cooch versus Smith. Pretty clear and easy to understand holding of this case. A non-refundable deposit clause is unenforceable. We see non-refundable deposit clauses all the time. I see them more in the high-end market than I do in other markets because people with money seem to think that they know what they're doing and they can write whatever they want at the contracts. <laughs> <laughs> the trouble is people with money who write those things tend to forget that the person who's buying their property has money too. And people with money tend to have lawyers and tend to fight over getting their money back. Okay, so let's, but the conclusion in this case is pretty clear. There was another case decided a few years back, came to the same conclusion. Let's talk about it. In this case, buyer and seller entered into a contract in January, happened to be 06. It doesn't really matter when it was. By September of that same year, the buyer canceled. So obviously it not closed by September. I don't know what was going on for nine months. The buyer canceled. For the purpose of our discussion, the buyer was in breach of contract. Lo and behold, they had a clause that there was a non-refundable deposit. Now this was not your $1,000 deposit or your $10,000 deposit. 
This is a $14 million property with a $620,000 deposit. <laughs> buyer canceled for purpose of our discussion. Buyer is in breach of contract. Seller says, non refundable deposit. Thank you. Goodbye. Buyer says, I'm not walking away from $620,000. Give me my money back. Seller wouldn't. Of course, a lawsuit ensued. Ultimately, what did the court say? The court says, well, what is the purpose of a non-refundable deposit? The purpose is to penalize the buyer. It is what's called a forfeiture clause. If you don't do what you're supposed to do, there's going to be consequences. You're going to lose over half a million dollars in this case. The court says, well, you know, we have another way to deal with that in California. We have something called a liquidated damage law. We have a clause in our contract, a liquidated damage clause. It has to be in a certain size type. It has to be in bold font. Bold type, certain size font. Okay. It has to be separately signed or initialed. If you have multiple payments, there has to be separate liquidated damage clause for each of those multiple payments. <coughs> so if you've ever had multiple payments and you have a liquidated damage clause, hopefully you've used a form that we call the RID form, the Receipt for Increased Deposit Clause. Because if you didn't, only the first payment is going to count towards liquidated damages and none of the other ones will. So the court says, we have a way to deal with that in California. But that's not how you dealt with it. You just said you have a non-refundable deposit clause. Well, when does it apply? Have any of you ever had somebody put a non-refundable deposit clause in their contract? You're asking me? Okay, I'll ask you. Yeah, all the time. All the time? <laughs> yeah, let the record show John Altamir is not here. Yeah. <laughs> 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 he is the big one. <laughs> When I ask this question, I usually get to say, well, when do you think that applies? <coughs> do you think it applies if the buyer breaches the contract? Do you think a non-refundable deposit clause would be applicable? Let's assume, forget about this case for a moment. Do you think it would be applicable when the buyer just outright breaches the contract? Do you think that's when a non-refundable deposit clause would come into play? So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What about if the buyer cancels because of a contingency? Depends what's written. Okay. Well, let's say there's a contingency, a financing contingency, an inspection contingency. The buyer says, I can't get the loan. I don't like the property. The buyer says, I cancel, and my contingency rights are still in effect. I'm canceling. Do you think the money with the non-refundable deposit clause should be returned or not? Should be returned. Some people say it should be returned. Well, I say, well, if it should be returned, if it does not apply in the case of a contingency, then it's really not a non-refundable deposit, is it? Right. Okay. It's only non-refundable if the buyer breaches. Right. Well, that's exactly what the liquidated damage law is for. Right. And I'll even make it worse. If all it says is buyer's $620,000 deposit is non-refundable, what would happen if the seller breached? The buyer's ready to close. The seller says, I changed my mind and thank you for the $620. <laughs> <laughs> and the buyer says, what? And the seller says, well, it says non-refundable, right? 